Uh, if I can turn the timer off. Where'd the timer go? Okay, stuff on its own. Very creepy. Okay, so we have this neural network. It's got inputs, it's got one output. And these lines, they mean multiply by a weight. So to, um, if you saw the three blue and brown video, you knew very well, but just to make sure everybody's on the same page. So we have these inputs, inputs, and these represent the values x1, x2, all the way up to xn. And then these lines, these represent weights. So we had weight one, weight two, all the way up to weight n. We have n weights, and this notation just means do w1 times x1. So like one of these things means do w1 times x1, and this, this machine is like doing a plus. So we're adding them all together, plus w2 times x2, all the way up to dot, 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 wn times xn wn times xn. So the weights next to the value mean multiply. You know, don't cross it out, highlight it. Um, and then we're adding them all together. So they're all going into one input, and that is the output. Uh, the output, which I guess let's make that purple too. This is the what I call the output. And that's the output. And there's one other thing, which is that you add on a bias fee. So there's additionally this like plus b floating around. And that is another parameter. So there's two types of parameters. There's these weights and these biases. And that is technically, very speaking, some kind of very simple neural network. And this thing we've seen many times in the course before, it also has another name. And could you recognize the other name? Let's see, what do people say? The other name for this beast is, so single, single layer perceptron. That's what a single layer perceptron means. So some people call it that. Although I think technically a perceptron also has some nonlinearity built into it. This one has no nonlinearity. Uh, CNN is a convolutional neural network. That is something completely different. This is not a CNN. This is much simpler than a CNN. Uh, ANN stands for artificial neural network. And I guess, yes, it is. Uh, single layer network, it is a single layer network. But what I was going for, this is linear regression. <laughs> this is linear regression. So if you said linear regression, that's what it is. It's a very complicated way of saying linear regression. Or if you want, uh, I don't know, this is how you express linear regression with a diagram. And we'll see that this is linear regression. I'm going to show you how to implement it in actual Python code in this JAX language. Uh, so we're going to use this JAX language from Google to implement linear regression, the sort of machine learning way. And the advantage is if you do it and you think of this diagram, it's going to be very simple to generalize it to more complicated things. So we're going to start with linear regression and we're going to build up to an actual neural network. And hopefully you already know a little bit about linear regression. You'll take that knowledge and you'll carry it with you and you'll know how a neural network works altogether. OK, so here we go. So like I said, we're going to use this. We're going to use JAX. And JAX, you should think of as just fancy NumPy. Fancy NumPy. So what is JAX? And so it's an autograd package for high performance numerical computing. And here is the nice thing. It can automatically differentiate NumPy functions. So in NumPy, we did all these commands with arrays. We, we saw how you used it. You store your x's. You store your y's. You can do operations. And the only thing that JAX brings to the table that is amazing is it can automatically do the gradient. And we saw a few classes ago, many classes ago now actually, we did linear regression and I did the gradient by pen and paper, right? So I took my pen out and I did pen and paper and we figured out the gradient and we used gradient descent to train our uh, loss function. Uh, but JAX will do that automatically. So that's the only difference is that you can skip the step of doing pen and paper um, and it will do it uh, automatically for you. And it has some extra speed ups because it will compile the NumPy programs to run on GPUs and TPUs. And in particular, it's really fast at parallelizing things. So if you want to do something once, uh, that's fine. If you want to do the same thing 10,000 times over for 10,000 different images, it can help you speed that up automatically. You don't have to write any extra code. And in fact, it's so similar to NumPy, like if you understand NumPy, you basically understand JAX. The very first line in our data set, I believe, is import jax.numpy as jnp. And so whenever you see a code where they import numpy as np, this is jax.numpy as jnp. And you basically just put a j in front of everything you were doing before. And other than that, it's exactly the same. There's a, a few very, very minor differences. Um, I won't get into them. I got, okay, one important difference 
is in NumPy, you can change one entry of an array. So you have an array, you say like, give me the seventh entry, change it to a five. In Jax, it will yell at you if you try to do that. You have to change the whole array up so that arrays are immutable. They can't be changed, but you'll see that won't come up very often. Um, the other things we need, we're going to need Jax to do derivatives. So we're going to do Jax.gradient using this package. This is going to tell us how fast things are going. And this QDM package is a really cute thing. Does anybody know what the QDM package does? Yeah, what does it do? Yeah, so basically it tells us the processing time. Yeah, it just draws cute little bars. As, as things are happening, there's a little bar that comes up. Okay, but so we're going to do this. If you have a computer, I highly recommend you open this up. It's called the MNIST example with blanks. And we're going to go from start to finish. And it might take us two classes here to get through, but we're going to do it. And the first thing we do, um, and there's no blanks here, is we're going to load the MNIST data set. So there's a nice uh, person who made this MNIST data set, data set uh, Jan LeCun, and he has on his website, he has the data set. And you know, this is some, some stuff. I didn't write this. I like, found this somewhere. And what it does is it loads the MNIST data set into our uh, thing. So we're going to have um, two things called test and train, which we're going to get from the MNIST data set. So this sets up this MNIST data set thing. And then we're going to use it to make test and train. So here are the train images and train labels. And here are the test images and test labels. And we're going to check what they are. So I'm going to click over here on the variable explorer. And you can see what we have. So the MNIST data sets are some complicated MNIST object. But the test and train images are exactly what you think. They're NumPy arrays. So for example, the labels is a NumPy array of size 10,000. And it goes 7, 2, 1, 4, 5, 6. Very simple stuff that we've done the whole time. The uh, actual images are also an array. And they're an array of size 10,000, 784. And 784, you might recognize, is 26 squared. And that's because every single image is a 26 by 26 image. They're not 26 by 26. They're 28 by 28. So here are the training images. And they're really arrays of numbers. They're 28 by 28. But we think of that as this size, 784. And they are zeros. Um, I believe they're between 0 and 256. And you can see the top row is all zeros. It's 100% black. But inside the middle, there are numbers that are like 255 that are white. And so here, what I've done is I've just plotted the first few. Um, so the actual thing is size. 784, the train images, 10,000 examples by size 784. And in this code, I reshape them to 28 by 28. So take this vector of size 784, reshape it to a 28 by 28, and plot it. So that's train.images of i is being plotted here. And the title is the label uh, of the training label. So the train label. And these are the numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And you can see there are handwritten digits. I believe they were taken from like the post office way back in time, many years ago. And someone took pictures of these things people wrote down on post office labels and wrote down all the labels. So that's the data set, these 28 by 28 images that we think of as size 784. We've shoved 10,000 examples into our train images array. And our goal is to come up with um, a classifier that will classify them. Uh, any questions or comments so far about the setup or these arrays that we have floating around? So we've been using NumPy arrays all year. So hopefully that part um, is OK. But feel free to ask if there's any questions so far. OK, so let's get going. And the first thing we're going to do, like I said, is implement this thing. So we're going to have the inputs over here. We're going to implement what does this funny, what do these lines mean, and what is the output. And the first thing I'm going to show you is that uh, we have to write down what the parameters are. And I wrote down the parameters over here. I said they were the w's and the b's. And I'm going to store all the w's together in a vector. And I'm going to store the b as a number. So I'm going to say the parameters, the parameters, the params, are the w's and the b's. And I'm going to think of them as having two parts. The w, w, which is going to be a vector. So I'll write w. And this has n entries. It's an array of size. N comma, and uh, it's gonna have we're gonna have the number b just floating on its own b over here, and that's just a number, a number, and those are the params. Um, and in our case, n is the size of the input, so n equals seven hundred and eighty-four, and that's because we know that our input, our input is the image, 
and the image is a vector of size 784. So we're going to input one picture of size 784 um, here as the x, and then that's the number of parameters we need. So let's set that up in our code. So that is the next thing to do in our code. Uh, so we're going to do linear regression, and we think of it as the 784 by 1 graph. Right? You saw the picture. It looks like this. And we're going to start by generating these parameters. And so what I did is I told the computer our layer sizes are 784 comma 1. So just looking at the picture, we have two layers. The first layer is size 784. The second layer is size 1. And so this layer sizes tells the computer what sizes we have. And then this params, we're just calling this function init network params layer sizes key. Layer sizes say make parameters that go with the layer sizes you told me. So that picture of size 784 comma 1, that's going to generate the parameters. And key really should say random key. This is a random key. Um, that will generate all the random numbers. And we're generating the starting point randomly, and then we're going to do gradient descent to move around the parameter space to find good vari variables. So this is just like when we did uh, gradient descent with two dimensions many weeks ago, but now it's in 784 dimensions. Um, so this is the random key, and these are the layer sizes. And if it worked, so if all this stuff worked, then uh, layers params should be, like I said, exactly what I said. So it's a list. It has two things in it. The first thing is an array, and the second thing is a, is a number. Um, so the first array is of size 784. We can ask it. Please tell us, what is params of 0? What is params of 0? Please tell us. So that's the first thing in the list. It's this big, long array. Um, we can we ask it for the shape. Give me the shape. jnp.shape of params of 0. And that will be the first thing in the array. Oh, it yelled at me. Uh, I want, OK, wait, maybe I want dot shape dot shape is what I want. Still yelling at me. Uh, well, okay, what is params of zero then? Let me, let me see how this thing's working. Ah, okay, params of zero, this is great. So it's not quite what I said. In our model, we have one layer, right? And every single layer has these weights and these biases. So what I wrote down is not params, but is params of 0. This is params of 0. So this is the parameters for the 0th layer. So we, we think of this whole thing as the 0th layer. And what I have written down is not the parameters, but the parameters of layer 0. Later, we're going to add more layers. And then there's going to be parameters of layer 1, parameters of layer 2, and so on. But it's good to know that the parameters of layer 0, they have a first thing, which is the weights, and a second thing, which is the bias. OK. So now that I've cleared that up, which is good. So params of 0 is the tuple. And so the weights will be params of 0 of 0. And so that should be an array. Uh, OK, well, that looks like a big array. Now can I do ask for the shape of that? Please tell me the shape. Uh, right. OK, there we go. 1 by 784. So these are the weights, that big vector over here, which is thinking uh, a vector of size 784. OK, and it's, I, I did it as a row vector. One row, 784 columns. So that's 1, 784. And why am I thinking of it as a row vector? Well, I'm thinking of x as a column vector. And so when the w's and the x's go together, it's nice to have a row vector column vector, because in the output, we can write as W transpose the vector times, uh, not W transpose, just W times X. And this will make sense, right? We have X is a column vector, W is a row vector. You can put them together by matrix multiplication just like that. So that is why it is a row vector. And then B is the second thing. So if I do 0, 1, the second thing is a vector with just one number. That is the bias. So that's what's going on. And you can see how the actual thing works over here. So it's making the uh, parameters. Uh, one thing that's doing that's a little annoying is in JAX, every time you have random numbers, you can't just say random. You have to always give it a key. You always have to pass in a key in JAX. And that makes sure that everything is a true function. There's no actual random functions. There's only keys. And so the first thing you have to do is you have to split your key into two keys to make a weights key and a bias key. And then you can make 
random W's and random uh, B's. So random weights and random biases. That's what this thing is doing. And this does it for every single uh, layer. And then this stacks them all together in a big list for every single layer. So this will stack them all together in a list. Layer zero, layer one, layer two. In our case, we have a list with only one thing because it's only one layer, layer zero. So, uh, and here I'm using as the starting key, the time. Um, okay, so that's initializing it. Uh, and now we have this nice thing with our parameters. Of course, the parameters suck. We can check what the parameters are doing uh, by, uh, in, in a second, once we create our function, we can feed in the parameters and see how they work. So we've created the parameters, and now we're gonna create the function. That's the next thing. And the function lin r is going to do exactly what I said. It's gonna input parameters and what I call an image. The image is really the x value, x equals image. And we're gonna feed it all together and come up with the output. We're gonna output the output. So I really wanna take what I wrote down on pen and paper over here and write down this formula for output, put that in the computer. All right, so first of all, any questions or comments so far? And the second thing to you is what do I write? Because I have to, I've gotten the x, which is the image. I've gotten the wb, which is parameters of zero, just like we talked about. How do you combine x, w, and b to make the output? That's what we're gonna have to do. So if you have a computer in front of you, you can try it, you can run it, and see what you get. Uh, and I'll take suggestions from the crowd or questions on what I should type in here. So the lin r output. How do you take this mathematical statement, w1, x1, w2, x2, all the way up to w and xn plus b, and how do you convert that into code that works over here? And if we get stuck, I have the answers written over here from earlier. Uh, okay. Uh, great, okay. So, anyone wanna take a stab at this? So you have W, B, and X. X is the image that we're inputting. W and B got extracted from parameters of zero. Parameters of zero contain both the W and the B. The W is a vector. The B is a number. Uh, oh yeah, actually more specifically, the B is a vector of size one. It's a vector with one number in it. How do we combine those? to get the output. Inner product, okay, so one idea is inner product. Inner product, uh, let's, let's write down ideas. Idea one, inner product. Okay, and th there was an idea over here as well. Yeah, W times X plus B. Idea two, W times X plus B, right? Yes. Like that. Okay, this is great. So. If you do W times X plus B, so by the way, is this big enough that everyone can see it? It's okay? Yeah, all right. Um, so if you do W times X plus B, that is exactly what we want to do, right? We want to do uh, this, this idea that was written over here. We're going to do W X plus B, right? And you think, okay, you're multiplying, so you do times. If you do times, if you type in times, I will tell you right now, times, this times, will not do what you want. And that is because times in NumPy always means entry-wise multiplication. So if you do W times X, what it's going to do is it's going to take every entry of W and multiply it with every entry of X. Uh, and because W and X are different shapes, W is of shape 1 by 784, it's going to do some funny array broadcasting thing. W times X is not what you want. And so that's because X times is... Uh, Again, point-wise, sort of entry-wise multiplication. And we don't want entry-wise multiplication. We want matrix. matrix multiplication. So idea number two, right idea, but not quite right. Idea number one is actually exactly telling you how to fix the idea, right? The times we want is not regular multiplication. It's the inner product. It's the product of the type inner product. So we want to do times where times means inner product. And so one way you can do it is you can use the function, use the function, dot, jnp, dot. That will work, wx. So, uh, not 2x, wx. This will work for the inner, inner product if you use this dot function. Uh, another thing you could do to rescue idea number two is if you do w times x, I believe it will work if you then say jnp dot sum of w times x. I believe that will work. And so that will multiply w and x together and then take the sum you got to be careful about the axis, which is why I'm not 100% sure. So axis, probably axis equals 1 or something. 
So you say, multiply everything together, then add them. So w times x will sort of make a, an array whose entries are w1, x1, w2, x2, wn, xn. And then if you want the output, you have to sum them all together. Um, OK, so that's one way to do it. Uh, another, another way to do it, uh, idea number three, idea number three, is to use the command for matrix multiplication. So times means, doesn't mean a matrix multiplication. If you type in star, like shift eight on your keyboard, and you get that star, that always means entry-wise multiplication. But there is a command on your keyboard for matrix multiplication. Does anybody know what the command is? So it's, you do W something, something, then X. And if you put in the right something, then it, the computer says, oh, they mean to do matrix multiplication. I can do that. It's at. That's right. It's at. So if you type in W at X, that will also work. And because W is set up to be a row vector and X is set up to be a column vector, it's perfectly set up that W at X will work. Um, so as long as you're careful with your shapes, you can get away with an at. Um, w, I think the dot one uh, will be more kind to you if you screw up the shapes. So that, that will be more kind to you if you screw up the shapes. I'm going to go with the dot one. So this is the correct thing that will work is jnp dot of w and x. And there's one other reason that this one is the best is because this one is calling the least number of functions. So the dot function inputs w and x. And under the hood, inside the computer, the people at Google who wrote Jax have highly optimized this function. So when you call jmp dot, it's not actually doing a Python sum or anything. It calls some crazy C++ kernel that is super fast and will do it as fast as possible. Whereas, for example, if you use this one, jmp dot sum of w times x, first it will compute w times x, and then it will do the sum. And that is a little bit slower. You're, at, you're sending out two things to be done versus one highly optimized thing. Of course, the highly optimized thing does the two things combined, but it's highly optimized. So it's faster than calling both things separately. So when you can, it's better to try to use these built-in functions. OK, so we have jnp dot of w times x. Anything else? Plus b. Someone said it in the back. I'm going to count that. Plus b. OK, so don't forget the plus b. And that should work. So let's try that and see what happens. Um, jnp dot of wx plus b. And let's run it. So, uh, and I ran it. I told it, please apply it with the parameters. Remember, we made the parameters before. And take training images of 0 and print the linear regression on the parameters and training images of 0. And here it outputted bracket 10.79, close bracket. So it thinks the digit in the first image is 10.7. Uh, of course, 10.7 is a pretty crappy guess if you're trying to guess digits between 0 and 9. But the parameters are randomly generated, and they're supposed to suck right now before we train them. So that's OK. Uh, there is one thing that is slightly annoying, though, um, about this answer. Does anyone see the annoying thing about this answer? So the number is bad. That's OK. It's, the number is supposed to be bad. But there's something else that's annoying about it right now. So when the, when the computer outputs that, exactly what is written there, you should go, oh, the computer is doing something not quite what we wanted. It's an array. It's an array. Yes, very good. So these square brackets on the ends um, are saying the function right now is not outputting a number. It's outputting an array that has one number in it. And is that what we want? I don't think that's what we want. We want it to just be a number because then we're going to do something. We're going to say, like, this thing minus the number, the true value squared. We're going to do things like that. So we really want to think of this as a number and not an array with one number. And again, like you got to be careful with this stuff. For example, b is an array with one number. Um, but uh, uh, we want this one to be just a number. And so I'm going to do one more thing, which is I'm going to take this whole thing and say, please give me the zeroth entry. And now it should output just a number. So I fixed it. So it's not an array. It's a single number. Let's see if it works. So if I run it now, now it says 10.79 with no square brackets. We get a, just a number. All right. Any questions or comments about that? So we're really implementing by hand how linear regression works. OK. Let's keep going on. So what is the next thing we got to do? We got this function. Um, the next thing we can do is we could uh, start doing our training error. right? Find the training error. We're going to minimize the training error. 
And to find the training error, we're going to call this function, lin r, we're going to call it on every single image in the array of training images. So you could imagine doing something like a for loop. You could say uh, for i in range 10,000, because we have 10,000 images, and we're going to do something like uh, prediction, prediction for image i, it's going to be lin r of params apply to train images of i. That is the kind of thing we want to do. We have our function. We have our data set. We want to apply our function to every single thing in the data set. However, in reality, in practice, this is a bad idea. Does anyone know why this kind of code is a bad idea? Oh, yeah, OK. So there's a, so there's a lot of stuff missing, right? Like I'm going to have to put in like learn. Uh, Let's, let's add it in as a comment. Learn something about the prediction. So like, there's going to be a lot more stuff that goes in the loop, um, learning something about it, doing a whole bunch of things. But what I'm telling you is already at the start, if I see this code, I, I start to get really nervous. I start sweating. And I'm like, this is going to be bad. This is a problem. Uh, and it's a problem I told you about, I think, in the first or second week of the course. Does anyone remember what's the problem with this code? What was that? Time consuming. Time consuming. Yeah. What are you going to say? The number of dimensions. I think these are both related to the same thing. So time consuming. Why do you think it's time consuming? Because it will run like 10,000 times. Right. So this loop, when you call a for loop, it literally, the computer will go and it will do this 10,000 times. So say at first I do it, then I finish, completely finish the task, restart, do it again. And that's slow. That's slow. So if you call it like this, it will do this thing. It will do it 10,000 times. And not only is it slow uh, because of that, it's also slow for another reason, which is that range 10,000 is a Python command. And Python commands are very, very slow compared to any of the NumPy commands, especially the Jax NumPy commands that run on the GPU and are highly optimized. So you can do this. It will work, but it will be super duper slow. And it will be like 1,000 times slower than the fast way we're about to do it. And it turns out. If you're doing it a thousand times slower, you will not finish on a Google collab. You like it will take you too long. You will take you like days instead of like an hour to, to get everything to work. So this is simply too slow. If you can avoid a for loop, you should avoid it. And this is a classic situation where if you're doing a for loop using a dimension of something you have arrays in, you should try to find a way to do it with array operations instead. I think that was what you said as well. It's got something to do with these array dimensions, right? So instead of doing it like this, we're going to find a way to do it um, automatically using the NumPy commands so that it does it on the entire vector of size 10,000 all at once, or whatever size we want. So uh, this kind of thing is too slow. And fortunately, Jax has a magical trick, which is called uh, vector mapping. Let's see if they talk about this over here. And it basically does it automatically for we did. Let's see if they have uh, vector mapping. Sharp edges, uh, let's see, basics. Uh, wait, let me see if I search for a vector. That's not what I want, that's, that's some scary thing. Vector, maybe I search for vectorization. Ah, here we go. So dig a little deeper and you see Jax is an extensible system for composable function transforms. Um, others are VMAP for automatic vectorization. And automatic vectorization is exactly this idea. Take something that you can do individually in a for loop and write it as a vector command. And you can do this in NumPy if you think cleverly and use your human brain. You can figure out how to do this matrix multiplication thing we just did. It will work if you have the dimensions just right. It will just work. But in Jax, you don't have to think very hard. You just use the jax.vmap command, and it will take whatever you wrote, and it will automatically turn it into a vector function. And that vector function will be super fast. And so that's what I'm going to do now. So I'm going to use this vmap command, and you can click on it auto vectorization with vmap. vmap is the vectorization map. Uh, and it turns you, uh, anytime you have a batch dimension, that's like the number of images, you can uh, save you from having to carry that around. So you write your function without a batch dimension. Here is the predict function, just like we kind of did. And then you do, uh, you know, just like we had, they had jmp dot w uh, b. And then they do this uh, uh, vmap command, vmap the prediction, and you can do it that way. So I'll show you how this works in our code. It's going to be a little bit simpler than is what, written, what is written here. And we're going to make a version 
of prediction that runs uh, on a batch. And this is called the batched, batched linear regression. So it's a function. And what do I do? I'm going to start with the function we had before, the lin r function. And let me make sure I get the syntax right. And I'm going to apply jax.vmap to it. Jax.vmap. And that's essentially, that is essentially all you have to do. We take the old function, which was lin r, we apply jax.vmap to it, and then it knows this is the batch version. Apply, apply it as if you were applying it in a for loop, but do it automatically with vectors. You do need to say a little bit more, which is you need to tell it which entry is the batch entry. And in our case, the batch entry is the thing of size 10,000. So like the images are size 10,000 by 784. So the batch dimension is that 10,000. The thing that has the 10,000 in it, that's the zero axis, that's the batch dimension. So we have to tell it, in column zero, you will see a 10,000. And that is the thing you got to loop over, OK? So, so the way you tell it that is you put in uh, in axes, in axes, in axes. And in, in axes, what you're going to do is you're going to look at all of the inputs into lin r and tell it where is the batch dimension. And so in the function lin r, the function lin r inputs parameters and images. And so in the second input, so in the second input over here, I'm going to put in a little tuple with two things. And in the second input right here, in the second input, I'm going to tell it we're going to batch in dimension 0, in dimension 0. So I'm going to put in a 0 over here. And then it knows when I input the images, take the 0th dimension of the training images and do a for loop over that, and just apply it to all of them. For the parameters, if you put in uh, a zero over here, it would also treat the parameters as a batch dimension. And then you could have a different parameter for every image. So you could have 10,000 images and 10,000 sets of parameters, and you could apply the you know, parameter number zero to image number zero, parameter number one to image number one. You could definitely do that. If you put in a zero, that's what it will do. Uh, OK, don't, don't put a zero there, uh, where I have params. So if you put in a zero there, it would batch that. But we want to use the same parameters for all the images. We want one set of parameters that runs for all the images. So you just put in a none over here, and that's telling it, just leave it alone. It'll, it'll be fine. We're not batching that dimension at all. So that's all you have to do. This saves you from ever having to do a for loop. Now we're just going to use this batch function, and you can feed in a whole batch and not just um, one image at a time. And so over here, I, I can feed in every single training image by running batch linear regression with the parameters. And this whole array, remember, train images is a whole array of size 10,000. 784, and it will automatically do it for all of them. So hopefully it'll work. Let's see if it works. And you can see the first entry is 10.79. That's exactly what we had before. And then it's applying uh, the, the, the thing to all the other images. And so we have a whole vector of size 10,000 of the prediction for every single image. And it doesn't in a split second. It takes zero seconds. So even though it did 10,000 things, it doesn't do them one at a time. It does them all at the same time on the GPU. So the GPU has many parallel processing units. And the computer knows, OK, we're going to take this 10, 000, these 10,000 tasks. I'm going to give the first 100 to you, second 100 to you, second 100 to you, and so on. And it does them all at once. And that's why it's so much faster than a for loop. It doesn't wait to finish um, some of them to start other ones. They're, doing, they're being all done at the same time automatically under the hood. OK, so we got the batch thing. The next thing we got to do is make the loss function, the mean squared error loss. Question first, yeah. Under in-axis argument, are you initializing the, uh, the, what are you trying to do with none and zero? Are you initializing yeah. the array? So the none and the zero are telling you, because it's in-axis, they are telling you something about the input to the function. So none and zero are, it's an array of length two, with two things, none, zero, because the function has two inputs. And the first thing it inputs are the parameters, and the second thing it inputs are the image. OK, so we have parameters and image. And I, what I did is I said none goes with parameters, and then I said zero goes with the training image. So you consider the first image or the zero is the image. Right, exactly. So what it is saying is leave parameters alone. You're going to apply the same parameters to every single thing in the batch. Okay. Don't do anything to parameters. And then the zero over here means in the training images. When you receive, when I, when I call you Mr. Function, in training images, there's going to be two dimensions. And the first dimension, the zeroth dimension, is the one where you will see 10,000 copies of something. And I want you to apply it 10,000 times to that. And so by, by saying zero here, then it, the computer is expecting something of size 10,000 or whatever this batch size is, comma. And then it will apply it to every single one in that array. 
Yeah, no, that's a great question. And it is, yeah, it can be a little tricky um, to see this stuff. So it's good to see an example. Uh, uh, right, okay. Yeah, and, and you can see it automatically did the out axis for us, right? It, you don't need to specify the out axis because whatever you put in the zero array, that's the shape you get out at the end. You get a shape of size 10,000. Yeah, great question. Uh, anybody else? Okay, so let's see how you make the mean squared error loss. And again, you could make the mean squared error loss using a for loop, but you don't want to do that. You want to do it with all um, functions. So first, I take the parameters. I take the images that I'm trying to calculate the loss for. And I take the target. That would be like the true labels. And I'm calculating the distance between what we think, what the parameters say the images are, versus the, the target. So I, first, I get the predictions. That's going to be exactly this kind of vector applied to the parameters of the images. And then the mean squared error is what? Okay, so we've done mean squared error for many months in this course. So think of what you would write to get the mean squared error. I'll let you think for a sec while I have a sip of water. And then someone can tell me, what do you type in to calculate the mean squared error? And by the way, here's the example where we're gonna get the mean squared error on our training set. We're gonna call it with parameters, the training images, and the labels that go with it. Yes, so, so something, target, target, minus, and what do you say, minus predictions? So target minus preds. So target is the true label. It's a vector of size 10,000. Preds is going to also be a vector of size 10,000. If you do target minus preds, the computer knows minus means subtract them entry by entry. So the, first, the zeroth entry will be the target zero minus prediction zero. Target one minus prediction one, and so on. That will be a vector of size 10,000. And then you said, let's square it, right? OK. So when we square it, one way to do that is to put like this, square. You can also do like j and p dot square. Uh, target minus prediction square. So what, what will this output? Sum and then np dot square. Yeah, so right now it's a vector. This is, the, this is the thing to know. So target minus predictions is a vector of size 10,000, where we did the entry-wise subtraction of everything. Square, by default, like times, is entry-wise square. So now we have a vector of size 10,000. We've squared every single entry. So the next thing we've got to do is sum it. Um, so you could do sum. And again, jnp.sum is your friend. Uh, you could do sum. And then you could divide. We want the mean squared error. Right now, that's the total squared error. So that you could divide by something. Um, and in our case, it's 10,000. But we want to make sure that it works for anything. So you would say, like, the shape of the parameters or something. What was that? Yes, you can do the length of the array. Uh, this will totally work. You can do it. But there is an even easier way to make your code extra readable and avoid errors, which is if you have an array and you want to automatically divide by the number of things in the array, there is a function for that. It's a very nice, friendly function. NumPy, instead of NumPy.sum, you do NumPy.mean, <laughs> and that will work. Okay, so it's a little easier, and then you don't have to faff around with like getting the, the thing just right. It's very easy to make a mistake where you like get the wrong dimension, right? Like if you divide it by 784 instead of by 10,000 by accident, then you're gonna have a bad day. So it's always good to use um, the mean if you can. But that's the whole function. Let me let me make sure it's it's right. Uh, yeah, it's exactly what I have written. So great work. And if you run it, let's see what we got. Uh, our mean squared error is 260. Of course, the mean squared error in the course I've always been doing the root mean squared error because the root mean squared error is easier to understand. So maybe I should say, um, let's, do, let's, let's print out the root mean squared error, and I'm just going to do the square root of what it says, the square root of all this stuff. And that'll be the root mean squared error. And again, it should work. So the root mean squared error is 16. So we're trying to estimate digits from 0 to 9, and we're off by typically like 16, which is pretty bad, pretty bad. So we're, we're, we're doing guesses that are like 25 or like negative 16. But that's okay because we haven't trained it at all yet. This is supposed to be a random function, right? Um, it's not surprising that it's doing bad. Uh, uh, and so it's, uh, the fact that it's off by 16 is actually things I think are working just right. So the next thing to do is the training loop. So we're going to train it using gradient descent. And this is where it's a little harder to see what's going on, but hopefully you understood the explanation from many months ago where we did the whole thing. We're doing exactly what we did by hand earlier. And you saw that um, three blue on brown video 
where they were explaining it as well. So we're going to take the gradient of the loss function with respect to the parameters and then just update all the parameters a little bit. Yeah? For the loss function, I get you're trying to explain the linear regression model and right. for the single layer. And yeah. uh, for that, we are using uh, the mean squared error. Right. But it's a classification problem. Yes. So we should ideally use accuracy to. Yes, that's right. And so that's what we're going to do next. So we're going we're gonna to get it working with mean squared error, and you're going to see how it works, because that's the one we did earlier in the course. It's going to be exactly the same. And then we're going to modify it a little bit to do exactly what you're suggesting, using accuracy okay. and that kind of thing. Yeah, very good suggestion. This is like totally true. This is like a crazy person, like mean squared error on, on digits 0 to 9 is not the right thing to do. Um, but we're doing it to just set up, so you see. Yeah. OK, so if you want, you can pretend it's like housing prices or something. OK, so how are we going to do the training loop and so this is a function called training loop. And what training loop does is it inputs a loss function. So you tell me what you want to minimize. Um, it also has room for an accuracy function in case you want to also know the accuracy as you go. We're not going to use that yet. And it's going to have some number of epochs. And an epoch means show me all the data one time. So the first epoch is we take all 10,000 images, we look at them, we learn a little bit from them. The second epoch, we do it again. And the number of epochs is how many times in total we do it. It also has a step size. That's going to be how big our steps are. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to take the parameters and treat them as a global function and just update the parameters. So in real, in real neural network code, you don't often do this global variable thing. This is just for fun to make this a little bit easier to understand. We have the parameters we had before, and I'm just going to update them as a global variable. And in this one, I really am using a for loop. So remember, I said for loops are bad. You don't want to do something and then have to finish it and then do the next thing. Except in this case, we're updating the parameters. So there really is no way to know what to do in the second round until you finish the first round, right? So this for loop is in some sense unavoidable, um, or at least it's, it's very difficult to avoid. So in this one, you really can use a for loop, and it's OK. And what does the function do? So just print out what we're working on. Um, uh, start a little clock so we know how long it's going. This tqdm function will draw a cute little bar for us to let us know how far we, we're done. Um, and this training generator is just going to take the images and spit them out sort of in order. OK. And what we're going to do is we're going to compute the gradient. We're going to compute the gradient. And then once we know the gradient, we're going to update the parameters. Um, we're going to update w and b based on the gradient dw and db. And these are the two things that you have to fill in. Now, a long time ago in the course, I filled in this gradient formula. I did it by hand. So you can get out a pen and paper. You can write down the formula for the neural network and the mean squared error loss function. And you can really do a derivative like you're in first year calculus class. And then you can get some formula and type that formula in here, and it will work perfectly well. But the beautiful thing about JAX is that you can also do it automatically. So use the magic of JAX to do it automatically and compute the gradient. And the function you have to use is JAX.grad. So JAX.grad says, give me a function. I'll tell you the gradient of that function. And the function we're doing the gradient of is the loss function, the loss func. So whatever loss function we tell it, we will do the loss function of that guy. OK, so right now, jack stock of loss func is a function. We want the gradient at the parameters we're at using the images we have. So jack stock of loss func is a function. We have to feed in the inputs x and y. Um, so right, because our loss function inputs, our loss function inputs, uh, what does it input? It inputs parameters, training images, and training labels. So I got to do something like parameters, training images, and training labels. Let's write that in for right now. So let's reminder. Reminder, loss func is params, training images, images, training labels. OK? So we got to feed them in roughly in that order. In our particular case, params is params. Params is params. Uh, what are the images and labels? Well, they're the x and y that were pulled out of the training set. So they're the x and the y in the little batch. So I believe it should be like this. Um, let me double check my uh, solution key over here to make sure it's the, the right thing. Uh, loss function params x, y. OK, that's perfect. So uh, and the reason, again, it's, the reason it's params x, y and not x, y params is it's whatever the order was for the original loss function that we wrote already. I'm using the same order as before. So that will compute the gradient automatically. Jack stock is like a magic function. Um, how it actually works is this back propagation algorithm, which is quite 
um, quite complicated, but in terms of what it, the result is, it really is the same as if you took a pen and paper and really computed the gradient at those points. So that's the gradient. And now, using the gradient, I'm going to write down the gradient as dw db, and I'm just going to update all the things in my parameters. What is the formula for updating? Um, you could do this, w plus dw, b plus db. And that is saying, please update w, whatever dw is, whatever the gradient was, add that on. So do a small change to w. w was originally some value. Now just add on a little bit to its gradient. b, the bias, was originally some value. I just add that on, and that will update the gradient. OK. Any questions or comments about that? All right. There is a mistake. There's a serious mistake on the board right now. If I run it, uh, it will do horribly. It will actually do worse than just the random initialization. So initially, it was a mean squared error, a root mean squared error of 16. And now it's going to get even worse and worse and worse and worse. And that's because I made one silly mistake. So what I said is almost right, but there's a silly mistake. See if you can think of or catch the silly mistake. Is it a function call is wrong? What's going on at time, yeah? Yeah, the function call is wrong, like. The function call is wrong. Uh, this one. Yeah, the like the bracket should be inside. Right? Uh, ah, okay. Wait, this is a very good point. Okay, yeah. Let's 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 talk about this. So, if you do, um, you want to do jockstock rad of loss func of params x y. That's what you're saying, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is a great point. So if you do this, this will not work. And this is again, this is exactly like first year calculus. So, loss func of params x y. Once you feed in the parameters in xy, that's not a function. That's a number. That's like the number 7. And then you're going to do the derivative of the number 7, and it'll just be 0. So if you do this, um, either it will yell at you because it's not a function, or at best case scenario, you're going to get 0. That's not what we want. We want to do the derivative function, do the derivative function, and then feed in the parameters in xy. Yeah. So it's important. It looks a little funny when you're coding, like you have brackets next to each other, but it really is what we want. It's a very good point um, about derivatives. Yeah, and, and like you, you should check also the gradient is the right shape. It's going to have a dimension that is the number of parameters, right? So the gradient function is going to output something. The gradient of a scalar function is a vector in the number of dimensions. So this is going to be a big, a big array, which is why I'm zipping over it here in the right way. Um, fantastic uh, question. So that is not the mistake. That one I did right. You had an idea. Yes, Same thing. OK, that's not the mistake. Yeah, this is great. Okay, so first thing, I never used step size. Yeah. And so if you do this, um, potentially one possible issue is that the step size is too big. So I, I'm at some point, imagine I'm on a big hill, and I want to I wanna find I wanna find the bottom of the hill. So I take a big step in the direction of the gradient. But if the gradient is too big, I might kind of like step, I might like fly over to like Australia, and then like I'm nowhere near these hills. So I really should be doing step size. This is one thing. And step size is just a number, this makes perfect sense. So Step size. So that is definitely one correction to that line is you should include the step size. That is the whole point of the step size is it modulates how big one single step is. Don't make it exactly the gradient. Make it proportional to the gradient by some amount. And if it's too, too big, you can really have issues. So that's one thing. That's one fix. But there is one even more worse problem. Yeah. Direction of the gradient? The direction. Yes. What, what should it be? Negative. Yeah, it should be negative. This is what I had written down with a plus is not gradient descent. I had written gradient ascent. This is go up the hill, right? So if, imagine you're on, on a mountain. The gradient is the direction pointing up the mountain. And I said, go up the mountain, right? That would make the mean squared error as big as possible, right? Go the, so all the different parameters you have are like different locations. And the mean squared error is either big or large at every point. And this is saying, find the direction that is the biggest and start going up there. That would make the mean squared error bigger and bigger and bigger. That's the wrong thing to do. We want to make the loss function as small as possible. So it should be negative. Negative. So that is also a mistake that you might make sometimes. Uh, and now it should work. So we have the gradient. We have this update. Um, this zip makes sure that everything is the right shape and size. And it really will update all the w's in the right way. Uh, OK. And over here, there's some more stuff to print out uh, various things. So it's going to print out the loss. It's going to like write down all the things. 
This is just bookkeeping. There's no actual math being done. You could delete all this and it would all work perfectly well, except it wouldn't tell you what it's doing. Um, but let's give it a go. So I'm going to run it and see if it works. Uh, okay, where, where were we? Uh, mean squared error. Training loop. So this is the training loop. And it's going to run it. It's going to loop over into a bunch of times. Okay. Okay, so there we go. It compiled this thing. And then here we go. Here's everything from start to finish. So tell it the layer sizes, 784,1. That tells it that picture that we saw, the very first picture we did. Then we said, please initialize the network using the layer sizes and the random key. Then go do it, go train. And I made the step size super tiny. And I said, do it for two steps and do it for the mean squared error loss function. And let's see what it does. So we have that TQDM function makes this cute little bar that is going and it's running through all the examples. And I think it split the examples into 469 sub batches. So it's not doing all 10,000 at once. It's taking that 10,000 that wouldn't fit in memory. Um, so it's splitting it up into 469 batches. And then it tells you, okay, the loss was 120. Remember the loss is the mean squared error. So the uh, root mean squared error before was like 16. Now it's gone down a little bit. And the training loss was 120, the test loss was 119, almost exactly the same. And then we did it again, and look, the loss went down. So it went down from 120 to 85. And um, this is a little dictionary that has everything in it. But you see it's improving. Uh, you can improve it by running it longer. Now, if you just hit play and run it again, it will not actually improve at all. Uh, and that, there's a very important reason. If you hit play right now, you're going to be doing something very, very silly. You're going to feel like you've wasted 30 seconds of your life. What would happen if I hit play right now? I'll give you a hint. It's in line three. In line three. This line. So if you hit play right now, it's going to go run the code. And in line three, it's going to restart. It's going to reinitialize the parameters to wherever you started. You're going to redo exactly what you did before. But if you comment out line three and you say, do it again, then it will keep taking those parameters and keep improving them by running it through again. So. Uh, we improved it down from 120 to 80 in mean squared error, and now it's going to improve it some more. Okay. And I will also say while I'm standing here, uh, in the actual code I have, there is a faster version. That is about five times faster, uh, where you can again use some Jack's magic to make the updates faster. Um, but uh, I, I left those out for the sake of readability. So you can improve these things and make them faster and faster. Uh, you can also tell Google, if you pay them enough money, they'll give you a bigger computer, things like that. Okay, so the training loss went down to 70, and then it went down to 59. So it's, it's decreasing, things are working well. Are we overfitting? Well, the training loss and the test loss look pretty similar, so we're not overfitting yet. Things look okay. And we can uh, see what it looks like. We can um, run our thing on all the training images and see what labels it outputs. So here are some images, and here are our guesses. So here is the number zero. We think it's the number 4.55. Yeah, pretty, pretty close. Here is the number four. We think it's the number 14.2. Uh, here is a one. We think that's negative 0.4. All right, not great. And here is the number nine. We think that's 8.4. Okay, so uh, you, you're pretty good, I guess, improving. Um, there are a couple of really silly ones that are just silly. Uh, for example, this 14, why are we guessing numbers that are 14 if it can only be between zero and nine? Why are we guessing negative numbers if it can only be between zero and nine? So this is the first thing that you can do, is you can make a better version by let's not allow it to output anything except for numbers between zero and nine. That will already give us a big improvement. And if this was just linear regression, it's really a headache to do that, right? If it's actually linear regression, uh, what you're talking about now is non-linear. It's not linear regression anymore. But because it's all implemented as a neural network, it takes like one second, just adding like one thing to make it output numbers between zero and nine. And because of the magic, the way we implemented it, everything is done automatically. You just like put it in and then everything will work. And so I'll show you how that works. So let's see how this works. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use the sigmoid function, our favorite function. And the sigmoid function, remember, it crunches down minus infinity to infinity to zero to one. And the sigmoid function in uh, NumPy, we've done this before, uh, is jnp.x divided by one plus jnp dot xp. So it's the function, uh, let's get the brackets right. Uh, it's the function, the sigmoid function. Uh, so I'm gonna do sigma of x 
is e to the x divided by 1 plus e to the x. That's the sigmoid function. And the way you do e to the x is you do j and p dot x. And just whatever x is, that's what you do. So this is the sigmoid function implemented in, in, uh, in uh, NumPy. And now I'm going to write a function called nonlinear regression, which is exactly like what we had before, except for it's going to always output a number between 0 and 9. And diagrammatically, what I'm going to do is it's really is like Lego blocks. Like you have this thing, which is made of these Lego blocks of weights and biases. And you have this function, which is the sigmoid. Now you can think of sigmoid as like a little Lego block. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it looks like this, the sigmoid, right? And it has inputs that could be anything between minus infinity and infinity, minus infinity to infinity. And it has outputs, which are between 0 and 1. And you can just take this thing and stick it, stick it over here to the output. So just glue a sigmoid to the end. So take whatever comes out of your neural network, glue the sigmoid on, and it's, it really is like Lego. Like you just like, you take this thing, you just glue it on the end. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to copy and paste what we did before. So let's go back up to our linear regression and copy and paste what we did before. Linear regression output, it was this function, right? So I'm going to copy that, exactly what we did before, and then paste it. So first, we do this, and then how do I get an output between 0 and 9? I just do the sigmoid of it. Sigmoid, sigmoid of lin r output. Uh, you got to spell it right or the computer will not work. Okay, output. In our output. So take what we had before, just apply sigmoid to it. That really is just like gluing uh, this, this thing on here in our, in our diagram. Fantastic. Uh, okay, of course, sigmoid is between 0 and 1. I want something between 0 and 9. How do you take something between 0 and 1 and make it between 0 and, and 9? You multiply it by 9. So you could, you could think of first you apply the sigmoid and then the next Lego block is times 9 times 9, right? n times 9 in our code is very simple, which is you just do times 9, 9 times. And so this will totally work. Let me make sure I didn't do something silly here. Uh, squashed output, OK. 9 and 9 times, OK. Um, I, did, I did do, in, in the code I have over here, I don't think it matters, but just to be safe and not cause bugs, I put the zero over here. So first I took it as a, as a single vector, and then I put the zero on the end. That should be exactly the same thing. Um, and now we have the output between zero and nine, and let's see what it does. So if you apply it to a single example, you get 8.999. So I applied it to one example, you got 8.999, and here it is batch. Again, the batch function, you don't need to rewrite it. You don't need to think of vectors or anything. You just do the batch, just like before, with a VMAP, and here it is on all examples. 8.999, uh, I think this one is 8.999, 8.99, 8.97. Uh, this one, it thinks it's 4 times 10 to the minus 7. So this one, it thinks it's, the label is 0 0.00000. This one, it's 0 0.02. Um, and the mean squared error has already gone down quite a lot to 2.3. Um, so this is good. This will work. There is one thing that you might notice on these numbers that is making me a little bothered. And the thing is that, yes, they are between 0 and 9. But there are too many that are close to 9 and too many that are close to 0. It would be nice to have some like 3s and 4s scattered in there. Uh, so this is a kind of a weird place to initialize, where everything is either 0 or 9. Um, so this could work, but this could also kind of crash the computer, because you know, things get bad near 0 and 9. So to make this a little bit better, what I could do is when I initialize, I could multiply everything by a small number to bring it closer to 0. And that's because if inside the sigmoid you put a 0, then you get a 0 0.5, right, outside of the sigmoid. And then when you multiply by 9, you'll get a 4.5. So I could bring everything closer, instead of being 0 and 9, bring it closer to 4.5 by just shrinking everything down a bit. So what I'm going to do is when I initialize it, uh, params, what is params right now? Params. Oh, param are params? Okay, params are initialized up here. Um, you could multiply everything by like 0 0.1. That would be a good, a good way to do it. Um, first of all, I might yell at you because this is a list. They might not know how to multiply a list. But second of all, we actually have inside init network params, we actually have this built in. We had something called scale. And if we just make scale a little bit smaller, uh, we can do that. And that will tell it how big to start them off at. And this is important sometimes in initialization is to start it somewhere reasonable. So the initialization doesn't matter too much. It should kind of work well. 
no matter what. But it's good to start it uh, somewhere um, where, where the answers you get aren't too far out. So let's start it like that, and hopefully this will still work. And now you can see um, it's outputting numbers that are all around 4.5, a little bit more than 4.5, a little bit less than 4.5, just by changing the initial, initial scale. So the random parameters, I just shrunk them down a little bit to make things a little better. And look, our mean squared error actually went down. Right? And now our mean squared error is only 8. That's pretty good. OK. So now, now technically, you know, if you, were, if you were coding before the Jack's Magic, you would have to start over and do everything we did, do it again. But we, in the Jack's Magic, it's all automatic. You don't have to do anything. Look, here is the function that does it, right? Parameters is initialize, training loop, mean squared error, uh, and do it for the nonlinear function now, right? So it's exactly the same thing for the nonlinear function. And again, I want to put in this scale. Let's put in that um, to make it start out a little bit smaller. And let's watch it work. So the magic is that even if you do these Lego blocks and do all sorts of complicated things, Jax knows how to do chain rule and will do the derivative for you, and everything will work out. OK, so let's see how this is working. I guess it takes like 30 seconds for it to work. OK. OK, look, it went down from 8 to 6. And you notice it takes a little bit longer. Um, that's because there's more computation to be done. When you do the derivative, you have an extra function, you have to do the derivative. Right? So uh, you can optimize these things if you want it to be even faster. OK. Went down from 6.29 to 6.33. Uh oh the training loss increased. And so when the training loss increases like this, one possible culprit is that you made the step size too big. So let me try and do the same thing as before. Let's not restart our parameters. But let me try making the step size a little bit smaller and running it again. This kind of thing is notoriously tricky, getting the step size right. And we'll see if it, I can, we can actually improve it. So I, I added two zeros to the step size. So it's taking really small steps. And if the you can think of that surface before, right? We were doing pictures of the surface where it was like a big bowl. It was very smooth. But the reason it was very smooth is because we had a linear function. And so if you have a linear function, you do the mean squared loss, you get a quadratic form. Now we have a very nonlinear function, right? It's got this weird sigmoid in it. Um, and so you can have all sorts of complicated things in the lost surface. And so if you take a step that is too big, you can like really overshoot the mountain you're on, right? Like you're like trying to go down this valley over here, and you just like overshoot it, and you're like way over there in Australia on some bad mountain. Okay, now it seems to have worked because the training loss went down to 5.7. Uh, that's great. And you can see the test loss is starting to be a little bit higher, you know, 5.78. Uh, by the way, this is already pretty good. Like, uh, uh, if the loss is 5.3, and then you do the root mean squared error, you're off by like 2, right? You know, like 2 squared. So we can see what it looks like over here. Hopefully these improved. Um, what kind of labels does it have? So I look at 0, and it says 0 0.16. Hey, pretty good. All right. Uh, 4, it says 0 0.4. OK, not great. Not great. We'll, we'll take the L on that one. Uh, 1, 0 0.8. Ah, that's good, right? And a 9, 8.8. .8. So like, it's, it kind of works. Like it's, you're kind of like off by a couple, a couple digits, like 2 or something. Um, so you know, this is sort of working. Um, and at least it's improving and getting better. Uh, but of course, as was pointed out halfway during the lecture, all of this makes no sense because I'm doing mean squared error on a function, on a problem that is fundamentally a classification problem. Right? Like outputting 7 when it's an 8, you're not actually close. You're way off. You're completely off. You're on the wrong digit. Um, so we should not treat it as a regression problem. We should treat it as a classification problem. Right? And fortunately, if you understood what we're doing up to, this, up to here so far, very easy to modify to make it do logistic regression. And logistic regression is something we talked about. Again, it was a little more complicated. But it's very simple to modify. All you got to do is, again, thinking of it like Lego blocks, just modify the picture to make it do logistic regression. And if you take this picture we have, there's one simple modification that you can do to make it logistic regression. We almost have logistic regression on here, except for you seem to like squiggle it a little bit. Um, and that is the question in, in the mathematics. What do you have to do to make it logistic regression? Uh, 
So if we want to do logistic regression for the 10 possible classes, then we should use a network of shape 784 comma blank. And so far we've been doing 784 comma one. So we said the first input was 784. That was the X, the first layer, this layer was 784. And then the next layer was one, right? Was one, because there was one neuron in that layer. And if you just modify this to 784 comma some other number, and you do exactly what we did, <coughs> okay, with some the correct generalization, uh, you will get exactly logistic regression. So uh, you guys tell me how many, how many 784 comma what, and I will I will give you a one minute to think of what goes there. Okay, let's take a look what the people say. Uh, I don't want the timer. 784 comma, what? Uh, some people said one, that was what we had before, so we don't want that. Um, some people said nine, and some people said 10. Nine people said 10. And the correct answer, uh, I'm gonna say the correct answer is 10. You could also make nine work. I'll explain how nine could also work, but 10 will definitely be the easiest way to implement it, you can get away with that. So let, let's, let's show you how to do that. Some people probably already know. So this whole picture was linear regression. Logistic regression is gonna be the exact same thing. X, you're gonna have X1 all the way up to X2, all the way up to Xn, just like before. That's gonna be the layer of size 784 in our example. And instead of just having one neuron in the next layer, you're gonna have 10 of them. You're gonna have uh, this one, that one, all the way up to 10. And so there's gonna be 10 neurons here. And the 10 neurons, you can think of them as being labeled uh, the zero neuron, the one neuron, all the way up to the nine neuron. And they're gonna tell you how likely is it that the thing we're looking at is that digit, right? Is it the digit zero, is it the digit one, and so on. So these really are the 10 classes, 10 classes that we have. Okay, and how are we gonna connect these things? Well, before we had all the, all the uh, 784 neurons connected to the one output, now there are 10 outputs, but you connect them in the same way. So you just draw uh, everything to everything. So you're gonna have one like that. You're gonna have, um, let's do a blue one like this, connected like that. And uh, uh, let's do a red one like this, going all the way down. So everything is connected to everything. That's called a fully connected network. And so now the weights are not just seven, not a vector of size one by 784. They're a vector of size 784 by 10, right? For every single neuron, there's 784 connections. But fortunately, our code just like automatically does that. So if you go to our code, we can automatically set up this picture, very similar to what we did before. Everything is gonna work out exactly the same. All you gotta do is change the thing we called layer size. So in, instead of layer size, uh, all we're gonna do is this output, instead of being a vector of size, or sorry, a number of size one, in logistic regression, the output is a vector of size 10 a vector of size 10, not 19, 10, okay. Uh, 10 because it's zero to nine. And what I'm gonna do, here is the function log gr log p. What we're gonna do is we're gonna, just like we implemented linear regression, we're gonna implement logistic regression by just calculating the logits. Uh, and if you remember how to do that, the logits are exactly the multiplication from before. So it's exactly implementing in this picture, this kind of multiplication, uh, right? So it's going to be the same thing as before, where logit number zero, output zero, is going to be 
you know, w1, x1, plus w2, x2, exactly as before. And the only difference is you do it 10 times. Uh, w784 times x1, x784. And the only difference is that this is, you know, there's a w0, there's a w1, all the way up to a w9. You do the same exact formula, you just do it 10 times. So nothing will change. This thing is exactly the same as before. It's going to be the dot product. And again, you can do it with at or whatever. So j and p dot of w and x plus b. Okay. And now, like, for example, the bias, instead of having just one number, the bias will be uh, 10 numbers. So before a dub b was a vector with one entry, now it's a vector with 10 entries. It's whatever the size of this layer is. That's the b. Um, let's see. Can I? Uh, I, could, I could at least run this um, and look at params and then tell you about params to convince you guys of what it's doing. So let's, uh, let's ask it for params now. And so if I look at params of zero, that's the first layer. Params of zero of zero will be the weights. And so I can say, please give me the shape of the weights. And it should be uh, 784 by 10, 10 by 784, right? So we have 10 vectors each one of which is size m84, and they're stacked together into 10 rows. And if that's the weight for each one, and I have the bias for each one, which is 10 columns, where there's 10 biases, the bias for the first thing and second thing and so on. So I can add those in, right? So that's w0, I should add on plus, plus b0. That's output zero, and you're gonna do this 10 times all the way up to output number nine, which is the same thing, same formula, but with the different, uh, Zero switch to nines, right? So we're doing it many times. And this is the nice thing, is that this dot product will take care of that for us. So when you do dot product, it will automatically do the right thing. So these are the logits. There are numbers between minus infinity and infinity. It's a vector of size 10. Um, by doing w with x, which will, will have shape 10, because w is shape 10, plus b, which is also shape 10. So that's perfect. Those are the logits. And then you have to go from the logits you have to go from that to the log probabilities. And this is the part uh, where you have to do the generalization of the sigmoid function, um, right? So the sigmoid function, uh, the sigmoid function is sigma of x is e to the x over one plus e to the x. That converts one number to something between zero and one. It converts one minus infinity to infinity to a probability. But we have to do converting 10 numbers. So we have some like generalized sigma of, uh, I'm gonna call them logit zero, logit one, all the way up to logit nine. And we gotta convert that to probabilities or more accurately log probabilities. So we gotta, we gotta figure out what is the log probability of zero and so on. Okay, log probability of nine. Okay, and this is something we talked about earlier in the course, how to do this. And it looks a lot like this sigmoid function. It again involves exponentials and adding things together. Uh, it's not super complicated. And that's what we're gonna fill in on this line right here to find the log probabilities. It's gonna be something, some function of the logits involving something that looks almost like the sigmoid function. Um, I will leave it until next class to do it. So we'll, we'll pick this up next class. Next class we'll finish doing the logistic regression. And then once we finish doing the logistic regression, you will see it's a very simple one little modification to make it a deep neural network and then really have like a really high accuracy, like 98% accuracy. Um, so we'll see that uh, next class. If you want, in the meantime, it's a great exercise for you. Try to fill in this formula and see what it is. And you know, the solution is also on the GitHub. There's the one with blanks, there's the one without blanks. You can peek and see the one without blanks uh, if you want to know the answer. Okay, um, so we'll stop there and see you guys on uh, next class on Tuesday.